be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out turn back to praise when the darkness closes in love Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those that are um, uh, out there in the uh, land of live stream, it's uh, great to see you and to say good morning. Uh, I hope um, you're looking forward to our time together, as I'm sure you are. 
Uh, we have a few people here that are uh, still uh, streaming in. Um, some are live streaming, others are streaming in. That's um, a poor effort at a joke at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Um, my name is Brian Heath. If you don't know me, I'm the senior minister here. Uh, we're at St John's Asquith. Um, and uh, it is cold outside, uh, but not as cold as some parts of Sydney this weekend. Uh, we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to look today at uh, probably one of the most famous verses uh, in the Bible. And um, uh, there are times when we ask, uh, which is the way? Uh, which way do I go? You might be sitting in a car and um, uh, men, they don't want to turn on the, uh, their um, navsat or um, their tom-tom. Uh, in the old days, they wouldn't consult the street directory and the wife said, I think you're lost. Um, but uh, sometimes us blokes would say, no, we know where we're going. And then uh, before too long, we're horribly lost. Um, what is the way to go? Uh, what is the way to go in life? Um, and where do we find truth? So many people putting their hands up and saying, I have the truth. I know what is right. Um, but so many of those claims to truth contradict one another. Where can truth be found? And lastly, uh, we long for life. We want to preserve life. And uh, in these days when we are uh, challenged and where life is threatened because of the coronavirus, um, it brings anxiety, it brings stress, and it brings questioning of who is in control of our lives. Uh, but today uh, we will see one who makes the claim, the very bold claim, that I am the truth, I am the way, and I am the life. So uh, we look forward to, uh, to Tim unpacking not only that verse, but uh, uh, the verses around it in John chapter 14. Uh, well, most of our people have uh, come in, as far as I can see. Um, I hope you're settled and ready to go uh, at home. So we're going to join together now uh, in a prayer of thanksgiving. Despite the difficulties that we are facing, um, we still have much to thank our wonderful God for. So let's join together in this prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your amazing love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us that due sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be truly thankful and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory now and forever. Amen. Well, we do ask ourselves, where can truth be found? And uh, we, as Christians, believe that truth is found uh, in God the Father and in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to declare now what we believe, what we believe to be truth. So please stand as we uh, encourage one another as we say the words of the Apostles' Creed. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, please be seated. Uh, we've been reading our way through the book of Jeremiah. We're up to the last few chapters, and Murray is going to bring us our next instalment. Thank you. We've reached, um, we're starting uh, today's first lesson, um, reading from Jeremiah 51, uh, starting at verse 24 through to verses, verse 32. Before your very eyes, I will repay Babylon and all the residents of Chaldea for all the evil they have done to, in Zion. This is the Lord's declaration. Look, I'm against you, devastating mountain. This is the Lord's declaration. You devastate the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the cliffs and turn, your ch turn you into a charred mountain. No one will be able to retrieve a cornerstone or a foundation stone from you because you will become desolate forever. This is the Lord's declaration. Raise a signal flag in the land. Blow a ram's horn among the nations. Set apart the nation against her. Summon kingdoms against her, Ararat, Monai, and Ashkenaz. Appoint a marshal against her. Bring up horses like a swarm of locusts. Set apart the nations for battle against her, the kings of Media, her governors and all her officials, and all the lands that they rule. The earth quakes and trembles because the Lord's intentions against Babylon stand to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitant. Babylon's warriors have stopped fighting. They sit in their strongholds. Their might is exhausted. They have become like women. Babylon's homes have been set ablaze. Her gates are shattered. Messenger races to meet messenger and herald to meet herald to announce to the king of Babylon that his city has been captured. From, er from end to end, the fords have been seized, the marshes set on fire, and the fighting men terrified. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we just uh, have two uh, notices for you this morning. Uh, the first is our book of the month. Um, Living Without Worry, How to Replace Anxiety with Peace, um, a book for the times uh, in which we live. Um, you can get your copy uh, on the Royston Parade uh, exit there on the table or you can get one during the week um, from Jenny. Uh, if you don't uh, have your money and you still want a book, just put it down and you can trans direct transfer uh, if you wish. And secondly, um, I wonder if you've ever thought perhaps as we've been reading Jeremiah. Um, I don't really get the Old Testament or I don't get it as much as I'd like to. Um, an Old Testament prophet, where does he fit in? Uh, what's the place of the Old Testament? Um, do we need it even, given that uh, we've got Jesus and we've got the New Testament? Well, of course we do. Um, and uh, you don't understand the new without the old and you won't understand the old without the new. Um, so uh, there's a correspondence course from Moore Theological College um, and there's lots of help online but there's even more help because it's going to be a group done uh, via Zoom uh, with Dennis Wright here who's done the whole of the PTC and more I think um, as your leader. Uh, a group has just done Introduction to the Bible. If you'd like to do that uh, have a chat to Dennis. Um, it's going to start mid-September. Um, he'll tell you how to sign up. Uh, you can even do an exam if you want and complete one of the units uh, towards that certificate. But you don't have to do the exam, uh, no pressure, uh, but there's great benefit in studying as a group. So you may have a bit more time on your hands um, with uh, COVID um, and so why not make opportunity of that time by uh, studying uh, this subject. Um, if you're at home watching and you want to know more, just uh, give me a call during the week. Or if you're a member and you have the parish directory, just get Dennis's number and uh, give uh, him a call. 
Um, well, we rejoice in the work that's going on through the Bush Church Aid Society um, and our link missionaries in Lightning Ridge, Kurt and Beck Langmead and their children. And uh, Kurt uh, has kindly put together a video uh, just for us, um, the people of St John's Asquith, to let us know about what's going on there. So we're going to uh, have a look at that now. Thanks. Well, good day, friends at St John's. Kurt Langmead tuning here from Lightning Ridge, and along with Beck and our four kids, we're the BCA field staff workers here at Lightning Ridge Community Church. Hopefully, you can notice two things about the picture that you're looking at. Firstly, I'm wearing a rain jacket. We're thankful for rain that we've had over this weekend, and it's something that we continue to pray for uh, right across our region uh, with the effects of years of drought continuing to be felt by farmers and, and whole rural communities alike. So please give thanks for recent rain and pray for more. Uh, the other thing that I want you to notice about the picture is that I'm sitting out the front of the Visitor Information Centre. Uh, it's a Sunday morning here in the Ridge and right through COVID-19, even though our regular Sunday services have been cancelled, we've had the awesome open door of a half an hour slot on the local community radio station for a Sunday morning radio service. 89.7 Opal FM is the name of the station and each week we get to sing some hymns and read from God's Word. We do a little kid spot, Colin Buchanan often makes an appearance and I get to teach from God's Word uh, not only to our congregation members who are tuning in but also, God willing, to community members as well. The, the satellite dish behind me has a, has a reception kind of area of about 25 kilometres around the town which is more than enough to get out to all the ridges and all the camps that are off the grid. One of the things we noticed pretty early on as we entered into uh, different kind of ministry and, and life together during COVID-19 is that the usual sort of live stream option wasn't necessarily going to work so well for us up here in the ridge. We do have a lot of people living on camps with no access to power or water or even mobile phone reception, let alone internet, so that we can be tuning in on a Sunday to a live stream service. So the local radio, I know it's old school, but it's kind of our ridge equivalent of, um, yeah, staying connected uh, like all the other churches are trying to do in, in their different contexts and ways. In addition to the radio service, we've, we've had a weekly newsletter that's going out. Uh, and it's been just a, a, a lovely way to stay connected with our regular members, including giving us an opportunity to drop those newsletters off uh, at people's houses and getting out and about. So in some ways, lots of things have changed over the last few months, but in other ways, and I guess in the most important ways of all, nothing's changed at all. We have a, a, a vision statement here in the Armidale Diocese, which is introducing people to Jesus and helping them home to heaven. That hasn't changed. We're just looking prayerfully for ways to keep doing that while we can't be gathering together like usual. So please be praying for us. Pray for Beck and our four children, especially June and Arthur, who are school-aged and, and they're back at school. We've got scripture back this term. Thanks God for that. Pray for open doors on Fridays as we teach in the local central school and a couple of Wednesdays a term out at Gaduga Central as well. Pray that we can do a good job caring for those who are feeling most isolated, especially our aged care home residents and those who are already unwell and so finding it difficult to get out and about. And last of all, Beck and I have been pretty shameless with these kind of requests in um, conversations with, with our other link churches as well, which is if there's people who are listening in thinking, yeah, ministry and life in, in the Ridge, is that something that I could consider? Well, hey, maybe not necessarily in the Ridge, but in rural or regional Australia, there is a great need for people who are willing to come with gospel hearts. You don't necessarily need to come as a trained minister, but as a Christian to work as a teacher or to to contribute to the community through a small business or just to be a family who is committed to the local church. Uh, we would love uh, people to prayerfully consider putting their hand to the plough and serving God in remote and rural parts of Australia. The Bush Church Aid Society, BCA, that's who we work for, is a great way to find out more about the work that's happening around our country and you can sign up to our regular prayer newsletters by searching for our name, that's the Langmead family, on the BCA website. Anyway, thanks brothers and sisters uh, for your prayerful partnership, for your encouragement. It's always lovely to receive emails and just to know that you guys are praying for us and remembering us out here in the Ridge. So God bless you guys. 
And until next time, uh, stay safe, stick close to Jesus. See ya. Wasn't that encouraging? It was fantastic just to hear what's going on and how uh, God has provided uh, that, that opportunity through uh, Opal FM radio station. And we'll be uh, praying for the Langmeads a little bit later uh, in our service together. Well, we come now to the time where we're going to hear the passage read that uh, Tim will be preaching on. Um, so uh, Murray will come and then uh, Tim will follow. Thank you. My second reading comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you, I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you, you do know him and have seen him. Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have you been among, I have been among you all this time, and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and he will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask, in, ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I'm sure you've heard it before, uh, but the saying goes, you only know what you've got when it's gone. Well, are there ever times in your life where you fail to appreciate what is right in front of you, what has already been revealed to you? Uh, maybe it's because you don't quite understand what you do have. Uh, during the filming of a Quentin Tarantino movie, and of course it was Quentin Tarantino, uh, The Hateful Eight um, was the name of the movie, a 145-year-old guitar, more precisely, a priceless and loaned 145-year-old uh, guitar was accidentally smashed to pieces because the actor didn't realize what he had in his hands. Uh, he thought it was a prop, and so he yelled out, music time's over, and belted it into a pole. Uh, or maybe... You don't appreciate what's been revealed to you because you don't like what you have. Uh, it's a bit like perhaps when the service leader tries to tell a joke to get people into church. Uh, the big revelation of a punchline is met with awkward silence. And that, Brian, is why people come a bit late to church. But today we see in the disciples that what they struggle to understand and appreciate is what has been revealed to them in Jesus. What they have had as they've walked with Jesus, heard his teaching and seen his works. 
And as they reveal this lack of appreciation in their questions to Jesus, we actually need to turn God's word onto ourselves. Uh, We'll hopefully see the ways that we can better appreciate what we have, what God has made clear to us. And what he has made clear for us here today is this. Following Jesus means having faith and being fruitful. Well, with this in front of you today, what will you do? The first thing I hope you should do uh, is join me as we pray that God would speak to us today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed Jesus to us. We pray that as we consider the struggles of the disciples uh, with their questions to Jesus, uh, that we might learn how to overcome our own struggles in following you uh, and have a rich faith and be fruitful in it. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week, uh, we get a few more characters within the group of disciples. Last week, we had Peter uh, and his uh, thought that he didn't really need Jesus to die. Uh, But this week, we see exactly what it is they cannot see even though it's actually all been shown to them by Jesus. Now, in their questions, the shortcomings of the disciples are almost always highlighted. And of course, I think it's easy to think, well, I know the, the answers. Uh, the poor disciples, they're confused. Often that's the case uh, as we read through the Bible uh, and see the mistakes with a sense of hindsight. But... Actually, as we dig deeper into their struggles, I think we begin to see that they still seem to mirror our own ongoing struggles as disciples of Jesus. I don't think it's a case of, oh, I know more because I'm on this side of the Bible and have 2020 hindsight. Actually, I think these struggles we see in the disciples' questions are actually struggles that we still engage with today. And so Jesus' answers about following him uh, and how that requires real faith and results in real fruitfulness actually have the same potency for us here today. Take, for example, Thomas in verse 5. Thomas helps us to see how as disciples we might struggle with belief. Uh, Chapter 14 of John, and if you have your Bibles here, uh, it might help you to open that up so you can follow where I'm referencing. Uh, But really, all of chapter 14 is about belief. Uh, And you see that from the very first verse. But as we look at Thomas, I think we see the question of, well, how can we believe what we cannot see. It is, by all accounts, a good question when our belief in Jesus demands giving up our lives, giving up the visible for the invisible in many ways. Well, for Thomas, it's a question of following Jesus when he cannot see where that path was leading him. Verse 5, we see it. Lord Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Now, why doesn't Thomas know where Jesus is going? Is it because Jesus hasn't told him? Well, actually, if you look at verses 2 and 3, we see that is not the case. Verses 2 and 3, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I have told you, that I am going to prepare a place for you. And thirdly, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Jesus has told him and the rest of the disciples, the place you are headed is my father's house. The, The way there is through me. I will come again and I will take you there. Look, it's right in front of him. Jesus has laid it out. And yet, here we find Thomas still asking, what's the destination? 
What's the way there? And so we get Jesus' very quotable reply about, well, starting with the way, but adding to that as well. Verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words here, even if he is sort of repeating himself for the sake of Thomas, are clear. Thomas, the destination is my father's house. But there is no way to my father's house. There is no way to the eternal life that God alone gives. There is no way to know the truth outside of me. This is a wonderful verse for us as Christians to know as we learn precisely why Jesus insists on belief in him. Why we need faith, Christian faith in Jesus. I think it teaches us that the lie of those who say all religions are the same and all lead to God is indeed a lie. And a dangerous one at that, taking people down a road away from the truth, away from, the, from life, towards death. But, as important as it is, though, what Jesus says here is also incredibly scandalous. Firstly, surely it's arrogant, right? You are the life. You are truth. You are the way to God the Father. Who do you think you are? Well, the answer is, of course, he is God. In him is life and truth. He not only makes the way to God, but is the way to God. Know him, and you therefore know the way to God. But also, he's saying he's the only way to God. The the of the way, the truth, and the life is exclusive. There is no other. Imagine the stir. Uh, the anger it would cause in our community, if we put up on our signboard out the front of church, all other religions are a lifeless lie that would never lead you to God. Well, it wouldn't actually fit up there, so don't stress. But this is Jesus' claim. Jesus elevates himself in our view. Believe Believe in me, he says. Because there is absolutely no other way. See, all of what Jesus is saying here is explaining that incredible demand back in verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is calling for a complete dependence on him as God as the source of all life and truth, as the way to the Father. They know that, as we know that. And yet Jesus calls for more than knowledge. He calls for belief, true belief that is testified about in their actions. And he calls us to that same mindset and lifestyle, St. John's, he says, I am the way. You know that. But believe in me. Trust me. Have a real faith where your life speaks to your belief that Jesus is the only way. Well, we know that. But we don't always live that. Question is, what more will it take? Well, if that call to believe in a sincere way can feel like a struggle, or at least at times can feel like a struggle, we can relate once again with the struggles of the disciples. See, last week we saw Peter's problem with pride as he thought, Jesus, we can do this without you dying. This week... It turns out it's Thomas's trouble with trust. 
In the same way that there's a consistent storyline of Peter throughout the Gospels, almost rejecting the idea of Jesus at the cross. Thomas is consistently characterized by his lack of belief, his struggle to trust. Among his very few moments of airtime in John's Gospel, by far the most significant are here in chapter 14 and in chapter 21, after Jesus' resurrection. And again, you'll notice as we read it in a second, it's about Thomas's belief or his lack thereof. Now, John 21, verse 24, But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, If I don't see the marks of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Believe, Thomas, believe, Jesus says. Do not be faithless. But perhaps you feel a bit like, well, maybe deep down, particularly in the extraordinary parts of our faith, you do feel like Thomas in his questions. Jesus had told Thomas where he was going and the way there. He told him also that he'd rise again. And like us so often, Thomas either didn't understand it or didn't accept it because he thought it was impossible. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel that you do not understand what God has to say? Or maybe why he says what he does? And so it's hard for you to believe in God's word. Well, here Jesus' command in verse 1 of chapter 14 Once more, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus commands two things there, right? Having an untroubled heart and also belief in God, in the Father, in Jesus. But Thomas isn't the only one who has a tough time with this. I'm sure we're thinking, well, yes, of course, we have a tough time with this. Well, even within the disciples, it's not just Thomas. See, we've had Peter's problem with pride, Thomas's troubles with trust, and just to cap it off, because I couldn't help myself, we now get to Philip's faulty following of the Father. Uh, Verse 8, Lord, said Philip, Show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Now, Philip's saying two things here about his current experience of God. First of all, it's not enough. And second of all, I think in perhaps a quite hurtful thing to say to Jesus, he hasn't seen God. Now, does our faith ever feel like that? That God is distant that we somehow need more than what we have to go off. I think an interesting question to ask yourself is if Jesus or, or the Father showed up at church today in the flesh, uh, he didn't listen to the instruction not to mingle after church and stayed for a chat and he chatted to you. When you went home, would you change? Would you change in the next day, the next week, the next year? Well, if so, if that would be so life-changing for you, why? 
What exactly is the difference between that hypothetical and our real life as Christians? What is it exactly that is lacking in what we've experienced of faith and God that would be added to by that situation? That you'd seen God, perhaps? Jesus turns to Philip and says in verse 9, Have I been among you all this time and you don't know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. If you haven't seen the Father, then you don't understand who I am, says Jesus. When you hear me, you hear the Father's words, says Jesus. When you see Jesus' works, you see the Father's works. Like Philip saying, I've never experienced God, to which Jesus replies, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you can't get your head around my words, says Jesus, which, by the way, are the Father's also, then believe because of my works, which are so clearly the works of God. Now you might say, well, okay, but we haven't seen Jesus either, have we? Well, of course, uh, chapter 14 goes on to show us that we are not without God. As Jesus departs, he sends the helper, the, the spirit of God, to live in us, for us to know God, to be helped and not abandoned. More than that, we have the words and works of Jesus to read of ourselves. Jesus is saying you have right before you Reveal to you everything you need for following me if you just believe. And now, as you do, if you do, which we know the disciples, they do, you also have before you something else. My work. See, when Jesus speaks of their faith, their belief, it's not just head knowledge. It comes with fruitfulness. And when he speaks of their fruitfulness, he doesn't just say, continue doing what I've been doing. But in fact, he says something that perhaps catches us a bit off guard when we read it. Verse 12, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. Now Jesus is not saying here that our work will be more spectacular or more numerous in the amount of works than Jesus's. For one, if he meant more numerous, there's plenty of good uh, ways to say that in Greek, and this was not one of them. Secondly, though, it's a bit of a stretch for us to imagine doing uh, anything more spectacular than raising Lazarus from the dead or, or multiplying matter before our very eyes like Jesus did with the, the bread and the fish. and the, the list goes on. So what is it about the quality of the works of all those who believe in Jesus, that makes them greater. Well, Jesus actually tells us, isn't that nice? The basis of the greatness of their works is that he is going to the Father. By his sacrifice and exaltation, the whole of Jesus' ministry and teaching is tied together. There is now a clarity to their work that is won by what Jesus achieves on the cross and in his resurrection that 
showed in how the the difference showed in how Jesus' words were misunderstood before he died and rose, even by those closest to him. Well, more than just clarity though, the reason why we're able to do this continued work, this greater work, is because it's Jesus doing the work through us. See, verse 12, if you've got your Bibles there, the work belongs to Jesus. Verse 13, the works are enabled by Jesus. And verse 14, the works are done by Jesus as we ask for his help in his name. If you believe. Truly I tell you, the one who believes will do Jesus' work. Will you do Jesus' work? So often, and I think wrongly, we separate works from our belief in order to rightly say that works don't save us. However, Do you believe? I hope the answer is yes. If so, you will either do Jesus' works and even greater works, or you are calling Jesus a liar, in which case I would say you probably don't believe in him. Now, it's not a cause for pride, is it? It is Jesus doing the works through us but it is a call for action. It is a call to take seriously our belief that leads to fruitfulness. Well, what do we have right in front of us? If we were to read on, as I said, we find that we have not been abandoned by God. In fact, he is in us. It's more than just in front of us. We have God in us. We have the Holy Spirit, who, like Jesus, is God. And we have Jesus. We have the work and words of the Father for us to know. And so know God, have a way to God, and have life and truth. And we know that with more clarity and more ability to carry on his work, because he has gone to his Father in glory. So to conclude, let us just remind ourselves not to miss what is in front of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have laid before us what it means to believe in Jesus, what it means to know that he is the way, the truth and the life. Lord, as we do, we ask in Jesus' name that you would do greater works than even his through us individually and as a church. And all this we pray in his name and for your glory. Amen. Well, we are going to come uh, to a time of confession and um, we need to confess for the times we haven't believed that Jesus is the way, for the times when we doubt that he is the truth and times when we don't believe that he is truly life. So let's uh, pray this prayer together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way and have not loved you as we ought, nor loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have failed to do what we should have done, and we have done what we should not have done. We have broken your commands and justly deserve your condemnation. 
Father, we are truly sorry. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past. By your Spirit, turn our hearts to love you and to love our neighbour. Help us to live a godly and obedient life for the honour and glory, for your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, when uh, Luke was uh, practising earlier um, the song, Blessed Be Your Name, um, I had my mask on and I just started to sing uh, without thinking. And I thought, well, I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but Luke is, so he's going to come and um, sing uh, this song for us uh, with a guitar that he won't smash at the end. Um, but it's time for us to reflect on the words, to remember God's greatness to us. So um, let's uh, reflect on the words, even though we can't sing them uh, as Luke sings them for us. Thanks, Luke. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, soon I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back and praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory.
Well, we're going to um, continue in a time of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, in our current world of disconnection, we thank you that you are a God of connection. We thank you that in these days of social distancing, that you say to us, draw near. We thank you that in these times of uncertainty, that you are a God of certainty. That you say to us, I am the way, the truth and the life that when our world seems to have lost its way, that in knowing you, we know the way, that in a world of so many so-called truths, that in your Son is the truth, that in our fear and grief of lost life, that in you we can have life and have it forever. Help us, Lord, to trust you, to rest in your faithfulness and goodness, and to walk along your path, not knowing that we might, what we might encounter along the way, but knowing full well the destination of eternal life. We pray, Lord, for our church and ask that we might be a centre where people come to know you, to trust you and to follow you all the days of their lives. We thank you for those who discovered us via our, our pre-recorded services and live stream and in so doing came to hear your life-giving word. For those who are watching that we don't even know, Father God, minister to them according to their needs. For those who need salvation, that they might find life. For those who need encouragement, that they might receive it. For those who need rebuke, that they might be willing to accept it. For those who need the scales removed from their eyes so that they might see that you might do so by your Spirit. For all of us, whether gathered in person or watching near and far, bless us, dear Lord, and may we wonder afresh at your wonderful grace. We also pray at this time for our world. For Lebanon, recovering from the bomb blast, we ask that aid might be forthcoming in large measure. We pray that the government will serve the needs of their people and not their own selfish agendas. For Christians in that country, may they know in the midst of their suffering that in your Son one truly finds and has the way, the truth and the life. We pray too for South Sudan where at least 150,000 people have been displaced from their homes due to heavy flooding in the eastern Jongli state, which comes after violence in the region affected an estimated 400,000 Sudanese in early 2020 and last year's floods in the same area had already displaced a further 900,000 people. We thank you, Lord, for the work of Anglican Aid, who have appeals to help both these nations. We pray that significant funds will be raised and distributed wisely. And we pray now for our own link missionaries. We thank you for the Langmeads working in Lightning Ridge, and we thank you uh, for that video that we could watch from uh, Kurt, we thank you for the opportunity of him being able to um, present a radio program on Opal FM every Sunday. We thank you that that reaches out, not just in the uh, town of Lightning Ridge, but to the uh, outlying areas where there is no uh, proper reception for phones or the internet, but where they can hear the radio. We thank you, Lord, for um, uh, the uh, Money Box program and we thank you for those that uh, bring in boxes twice uh, each year. And Lord, as uh, September is box opening month, we pray, Lord, that we might be generous to support that work. We thank you for Chenny T working uh, in Japan, but currently in Australia. And uh, we praise you, Lord, that um, after her operation this past week, um, that the tumour was found to be benign. Uh, we pray, Lord, for ongoing recovery for her we pray for peace of mind and heart. And Lord, thank you uh, for uh, the provision of help and assistance for those living close to her. And we ask that in your time, she will be able to return to Japan uh, to continue the work among students in that country. 
We thank you, Lord, for Kathy Dad working with Wycliffe Bible Translators in the Northern Territory, and we give you thanks for the work on the PEV translation. May the testing, proofreading and choosing of art design progress well at this time. And Father, we thank you for Gilbert and Rachel working with Hadsia in the local high schools teaching scripture. And we thank you that Gilbert will be with us next week to report on that work. We thank you too, Lord, for the gift of new life and praise you for the children recently born to our members, Peter and Edlin. Uh, sustain them and their families as they bring up their new children in the knowledge and love of you. And we pray for Tim and Holly with their child due very soon. Thanks for sustaining Holly through the time of pregnancy and COVID-19. We ask for a safe delivery and adjustment for them both to parenthood. Enable them to bring up their child in your ways so that uh, he will not depart from them when he is older. And now let us join together uh, in the Lord's Prayer um, which, with the words on the screen together our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever Amen. And now our mission prayer, which reminds us of the action that we want to take um, in doing even greater works that Jesus spoke of. Together, Lord, make us a people who love people so they may see Christ, reach people so they may know Christ, equip people so they may serve Christ, and send people so they may proclaim Christ, all to your glory. Amen. Well, I hope you have been both uh, encouraged and challenged as you have uh, met this morning. Um, we praise God too for our children's program, which is uh, going on uh, at this time, and for the clash group that are uh, roaming the streets uh, doing a, whatever you call <laughs> those things, great race. That's right. Yeah, I was thinking chalk chase, but that's sort of going back to my uh, ancient days. Um, please uh, consider to reflect on the things that you have heard, uh, chat about them at a home over morning tea and um, I'm sorry that I have to say please disperse uh, quickly, um, that's what we need to do. I'd love to stay and chat with you and I, no doubt you'd like to catch up with one another but you might want to invite someone home uh, for morning tea uh, to do that. Um, but let me conclude by um, uh, reminding you of this again, reminding us of this again. Don't miss what is in front of us. With the gifts that God has given us, may they not be a cause for pride, but a call to action. So as we go out, uh, we go out to be people of action in serving our Lord Jesus Christ. May God sustain us in that wonderful task. Amen. See you.